Weather forecasts may seem pretty mundane, but predicting the weather can mean a matter of life and death. Knowing what will happen in a couple of days time isn't just a case of knowing whether to have a picnic at the weekend, it can mean rushing thousands to safety before a devastating storm hits. And with climate change turbocharging extreme weather across the globe, getting warnings to people before disaster strikes has never been more urgent. In October 2013, Cyclone Felin made landfall in India. This extremely severe cyclonic storm had winds over 200 km per hour and was following a path strikingly similar to a 1999 cyclone in the Bay of Bengal. That 1999 cyclone cost billions of dollars in damages and some 10,000 lives. But the death toll from Felin has been estimated to be as low as 22, despite the similarities between these two events. So what had changed in the 14 years between these storms? By 2013, weather prediction in India had hugely improved, and more importantly, these improvements were being put into action. Warnings were issued far and wide, and over a million people were evacuated. This is the power of early warning systems. The first step in an early warning system for extreme weather is knowing what the weather will do. To capture the planet's current weather conditions, meteorologists use weather observations on location, combined with a fleet of satellites that observe the weather from space. The data from these observations can be fed into computer models that simulate the physics of the atmosphere and ocean. These models work by dividing the world into a grid. In each grid box, the models simulate the physical processes that are crucial for understanding the weather, from the flow of gases to the evaporation and condensation of water vapour. And by simulating these processes, the models can estimate what the weather will look like hours and days in advance. Such a mammoth task can only be carried out by some of the biggest supercomputers that exist, dedicated to running this type of simulation of the planet. The supercomputers that simulate the weather's developments are getting ever more powerful, and weather satellites, which first took flight in the 1960s, have continuously improved ever since, with new tools and ever finer resolution. And this data has revolutionised forecasting. The European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts occasionally simulates their predictions with and without using satellite data. With satellite data, the computer model accurately forecasts the arrival of Hurricane Irma. But without satellites, just relying on direct on-location weather measurements, nothing, no hurricane at all, would have been predicted. Predicting extreme weather events, warning people, and acting to protect them are all parts of early warning systems, and doing them right makes a huge difference. And early warning systems don't just protect people from storms, they save lives from everything from wildfires to heat waves. For example, India's heat wave action plan saves lives by providing water and rescheduling work hours. Warnings can even reduce the damages from longer lasting events, like droughts, by giving farmers the chance to prepare. As well as protecting people, these systems hugely reduce losses to property. Even 24 hours warning can reduce damages by a third by giving people a chance to move themselves and their possessions out of harm's way. So why then do some weather disasters still catch us out? This is exactly what happened in Timor-Leste in 2021. Heavy rains devastated the island state, as well as parts of neighbouring Indonesia. At the peak of the rain, everyone was uh, caught by surprise. This is Pedro Marsal da Costa, principal advisor for the State Secretary for Environment in Timor-Leste. The heavy rains came virtually without warning, causing catastrophic flooding and landslides. You could see people uh... Uh, die in front of your eyes, but uh, how, how you, you cannot do anything. It was very hard. 
Lower income countries like Timor Leste often have big gaps in their meteorological services. At the moment, we have a very limited and basic system of early warning system. And Timor Leste isn't alone. Today, a third of the world's population have no access to early warning systems. These gaps are often in the world's most vulnerable countries. While over 90% of people in North America and the Caribbean are covered by early warnings, only around 40% have this protection in Africa. But it's nations like these that are already often hit the hardest by extreme weather. To make matters worse, global warming, driven primarily by emissions in wealthier countries, is ramping up both the intensity and the frequency of these disasters. Some global weather services provide forecasts of large-scale weather systems, but without early warning systems within a country, these predictions often don't filter to where they're needed. What's more, smaller-scale disasters can't be captured by such global forecasts. Those come at a low resolution, so if you've got some small-scale event that is taking place, um, those models are usually not able to, to capture such events. This is Mary Jane Bapape, Senior Manager of Research at the South African Weather Service. All this may be about to change. On the 23rd of March this year, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres made this announcement. Early warnings and action save lives. The United Nations will spearhead new action to ensure every person on Earth is protected by early warning systems within five years. Which begs the question, how? How can we get early warnings to the billions that don't already have them in just a few years? Meteorological offices can't warn about what's going to happen if they don't know what's happening now. And there are big gaps between what higher and lower income countries have at their disposal. Take weather radar, for example. This vital kit measures where it's raining. It does this by beaming out microwaves, which reflect off raindrops, and are then picked up by the dish. Networks of weather radar are standard in higher income countries, producing live maps like these. But when Mary Jane conducted a survey of countries in southern Africa, South Africa at that time was the only country that had a weather radar network. And a weather radar is actually considered a very important when it comes to thunderstorms, for example. Getting more weather stations, measuring things like rainfall and wind speed, right where they're needed, can be expensive. But there are ways of bringing down the costs. Basically what we do is we, we teach people to make their own stations. This is Paul Kachera, who works on the climate program at the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research in the United States. Providing 3D printers to countries allows local communities to build their own weather stations, which also brings down costs. Where a conventional weather station could cost upwards of $10,000, Paul's devices cost just a few hundred. Barbados is hoping to establish a network of 100 of these stations, and they've also been made in a bunch of other countries, like Uganda and Kenya. Filling in the gaps in observations is just one part of the story. After all, these data aren't much use if no one is there to make sense of them. And yet again, there is often a big divide between higher and lower income nations. So some Met services may have, you know, 100 employees, but some Met services may only have two to three employees. This is Bora Kim, who's with the Climate Services and Capacity Building Unit at the United Nations Environment Programme. But what use is this knowledge if you can't get this message out? A major problem for that Timor-Leste disaster was that the information that was known was barely circulated. Many were still sleeping when the floods struck. There's no one-size-fits-all here. Getting the word out means using any and all means of communication. For Cyclone Felon, for example, the India Meteorological Department shared detailed updates using SMS texts, email, telephone, television, radio, websites, and other social networks. Word was spread from national authorities right the way down to individual districts. 
Getting clear information out to everybody is a challenge the world over, and you have to do what's right for people on the ground. Is it, you know, Facebook? <laughs> or is it a notice on their community board? Um, or is it through the radio? Is it through the TV or other channels, you know? And just because a country has more money doesn't mean they're better at it. In fact, here on Planet A, we've got a whole video on how Bangladesh outperformed Germany in protecting people from floods, for example, by training thousands of local volunteers to go door to door with warnings. We can't stop disaster striking. In fact, events from heat waves to droughts will continue to get worse as long as we keep heating the planet. But we can take actions to protect ourselves, and early warning systems offer incredibly powerful protection. One estimate suggests that every $1 we spend on early warning systems saves $10 in damages. The countries that suffer the most from extreme weather are often the very ones that are missing these systems. If we're going to protect the planet with early warning systems, that's going to take the transfer of both climate funding and skills. But if the United Nations is going to achieve its goal in just the next five years, that won't be a moment too soon. For more on how we can protect the planet from disaster, make sure you're subscribed to Planet A. We have new videos out every Friday.